Well, thank you for coming for this 10 o'clock session this morning. I hope you're enjoying the lecture so far, and uh, we're glad that you're here. It is my great privilege to introduce my good friend Tom Hamilton as our speaker for this session. His topic is the holiness of sexuality. Uh, Tom came to Florida College as a faculty member in 2005 and joined the Department of Biblical Studies and has just been an outstanding uh, element of our team here since he has arrived. He is, if you know Tom at all, he is eminently qualified when it comes to studying the biblical text, textual criticism, exegesis, lexicography. If it has to do with the text, Tom is into it, and he has prepared himself tremendously well. Uh, he has uh, the AA from Florida College and the Advanced Diploma as well. Uh, he has a BA from Abilene Christian University in Biblical Languages. Uh, he has a MTS from Christian Theological Seminary and earned his doctorate a couple years ago in 2015 uh, from Knox Theological Seminary. Uh, his dissertation was on the family requirements for overseers of New Testament congregations as taught in scripture and as practiced in the restoration movement. He will be talking about an aspect of that tomorrow afternoon uh, in here at uh, 1.50, and so make sure that you come and hear, that is the right time, right? 1.50, yeah. And so uh, make sure you come back for that. But Tom is one of the finest Bible students I've ever had the privilege to know. I always look forward to reading anything that he has written sitting at his feet, and I know that you're going to enjoy his presentation as well. Tom? Holy sex are two words that just don't seem to go together for most people, like a trustworthy liar or a Christian prostitute. It's just like it's hard to wrap our minds around that. And another thing that doesn't really go well together is Tom Hamilton talking about sex. I really admired Mark's ability to get up here with such composure and talk about the difficult subject that he did. And we have two lectures specifically devoted to uh, the sexual aspect of marriage. And so, uh, you know, I, I commend him for doing that and, and recognize the difficulty. But I am very uncomfortable doing that. And so you might say, well, how in the world did we get here? Well, I'll tell you a story. Uh, kind of give you an idea how the sausage is made behind the scenes. Uh, we had a department meeting in which uh, we were deciding, well, what are we going to do for the 2017 lectures? Uh, what do you all want to talk about? And I said, sex. And uh, Dr. Petty and Dr. Caldwell got all excited, being church historians. And uh, <laughs> Nathan Ward, uh, he got excited because he knew I was talking about S-E-X, and he thought he could do something on Esther. Uh, <laughs> And Tommy Peeler did not get excited at all. He wanted to know why we would be talking about a number between five and seven. So, another department meeting comes along and we've worked up the series of lessons and uh, it comes time to pick speakers. I get a call from my wife, crisis at home, crisis. I can't even remember what it was, but I said, guys, I'm sorry, I have to leave. And in my absence, I was given this lecture. <laughs> so we will do the best that we can. Well, the question you may be asking is, what exactly is the relationship between Mark's lecture on the spiritual nature of sexuality and the holiness of sexuality. You know, spirituality, holiness, they seem to be pretty much the same thing. It is difficult to come up with lecture titles that accurately describe what the lecture is about in the half inch square space you get uh, in the publication. And Mark has done a good job of dealing with this unbiblical concept of sex 
that it's something uh, suspicious, it's something dirty, maybe begrudgingly accepted because uh, it's better than the alternative. And this lesson is dealing with the opposite. There are really two sides of the same coin, and it's the rather enthusiastic uh, reception of marriage because of some idea that it is God's divine remedy for sexual misconduct, that it is his cure-all for sexual temptation, that it's God's license for us to indulge ourselves in every selfish sexual desire, that everything that is vile and filthy by some peculiar spiritual alchemy is transformed from vice into virtue, that somehow it becomes suddenly righteous and holy and honorable. And so we do want to talk about holiness and what it has to do with sexuality. In the uh, published manuscript in the book, I talk about holiness as it relates to sexual nature. And Mark has touched upon this to some extent, and I, I believe uh, John Kilgore will talk about this in his lecture as well. And it is to consider that God made a choice to create us as sexual beings, and that's true whether or not we ever get married. It really has uh, no identification with biological reproduction because you're a sexual being before you're capable of reproduction. You remain a sexual being after you are incapable of sexual reproduction. And so, you know, that's not exactly it. And it certainly isn't marriage because not everybody gets married. But it still represents a, a struggle, a trial in life, something that God has given to us that if we use it properly, whether married or unmarried, that we can develop our character and grow closer to God as a result of that. And so I'll leave that aspect of the, the book for your consideration. And I want to focus particularly on holiness as it relates to the sexual act itself. And I begin with asking the question, what is the context within which sexuality takes place or the, the sex act itself? And you might expect me to say, well, marriage, that God has confined that to the context of marriage, and that's certainly true, but I don't think that's an adequate answer. There is a more fundamental answer. The context of sexual practice is the gospel. You know, Doy pointed us toward this in his lecture on Monday evening when he took us back to the beginning, and from the beginning, God made us male and female. And that included marriage, it included the sexual relationship in marriage. And all of that grows out of the fact that we are created in the image of God. And there's been a lot of debate about what does it mean to be made in the image of God. And I think all of the right answers to that question ultimately boil down to one, which is we are created as relational beings, even as God is a relational being. John describes God very simply, not once but twice. In 1 John chapter 4, God is love. And we, made in his image, are also to imitate that love. And so it's no surprise that when the question of the great commandment comes up, the answer is love for God, love for our fellow man. And Paul takes it a step further. He says, not once but twice, in Romans chapter 13 and Galatians chapter 5, that any command that exists is merely the application of the command to love our neighbor. And so all of the commands of God is simply the explaining and unpacking to us what it means to love the other. And so this is the gospel. This is the claim and the demand that the gospel makes. And as you think about it, the implications of this are staggering because it says that the entirety of your existence as a human being, your essence as a human being, Whatever basis you use to measure how successful you are or how human you are is all taking place within the parameters of a human relationship in which every action, every word, every thought is done solely and exclusively for the other and no action, no word, no thought is done for self. That's the demand of the gospel. And the gospel therefore becomes the repudiation, the absolute rejection of this modern worldview that we have freedom, which is a license to indulge ourselves in whatever lust and desire that we have, unencumbered by any sense of responsibility 
to anybody else with one exception that we don't trespass on their ability to indulge themselves and their lusts and the gospel rejects that and replaces it with a different philosophy a philosophy of slavery to serve the other without any regard to whether they deserve it or not and of course the ultimate example of this is Jesus the one who came to serve not to be served and lived a life of absolute and utter selflessness to serve others to sacrifice himself to sacrifice to the point of suffering to suffer to the point of full surrender not for any good for himself but for us and so Jesus becomes the demonstration of perfect patience Perfect humility, perfect forbearance, perfect forgiveness, perfect gentleness and kindness and love. And in so doing, Jesus reveals to us the ultimate truth claim about reality that you were created for this relationship with God and with one another. And therefore, you will never find your true happiness or true fulfillment except in losing your life in serving others. And so Paul expresses it quite succinctly in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, do nothing out of selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind consider the other as more important than yourself. And if you take Paul at his word, you really have to understand that is the claim of the gospel, the demand that we do nothing out of selfishness. So why are we talking about that? Why is that worth mentioning? Well, what is marriage? Marriage represents a unique opportunity. Even for two Christians who come together, you're talking about two people that have already made a commitment to die to self. They want to deny self and take up that cross of self-crucifixion daily and follow Jesus. But when they get married, their wedding day, in essence, becomes a double funeral. Because these two commit themselves to die to self even more so that marriage becomes this unique opportunity to explore the depth of selflessness in a way that you really cannot with others and to really push it to the limits of human experience so much so as is pointed out by several so far in the lectures this week when God seeks for an analogy to describe the nature of his relationship with his people it is that of marriage and yet it is precisely when it comes to marriage that we begin loosening the demands of the gospel it really begins with dating at least I remember when I was growing up all of the angst of you know teenage dating not that I ever did any of it because I had such cripplingly low self-esteem uh, so I fortunately escaped a lot of that it's a blessing as it turns out and uh, yet I, I distinctly had the idea that you, you buy into all of the cultural assumptions and practices of, of the age, and the only exception that was ever made is keep yourself pure. And how many have failed because the whole system is rigged against you? If you do buy into all of the cultural assumptions and practices, it's almost impossible to keep yourself pure. And what is this process of dating? Now, I'm not here to quibble about the word. What I mean by dating is forming a romantic entanglement without a corresponding commitment of the will. And I think I can say without fear of contradiction, the Bible knows of no such thing with God's approval. And so dating becomes a kind of uh, Whitman's chocolate sampler, you know. You have all these different chocolates in there with these mysterious inner parts. And, you know, you pick one and you're taking, a, you know, kind of Russian roulette here. Oh, that's that disgusting raspberry, you know, coconut, you know, whatever. Uh, and so you say, oh, I don't care for that. I'm going to try another one. And so you go sampling all these different girls. And your sole uh, basis of assessment about whether you want to form an attachment is, what is this chick doing for me? You know, what, what am I getting out of this? And if we find one that we, we find something we like, we're like, well, they chew on that a while. That's pretty good. I'll, I'll try another one. And yet when any problem arises, well, dump them and we'll go on somewhere else. And how this, this process that's so self-centered and avoiding any problem that arises is somehow going to result in a marriage relationship that is committed to 
and we're going to work through any problem that arises. Um, it's just a mystery to me how we think that's going to work. And then in marriage, we loosen the demands of the gospel. Satan places in our mind the, those questions. But surely, marriage owes me something. There's got to be something in it for me. On the day I got married, did not my wife make some promises to me? And shouldn't I throw those back in her face periodically? Um, and when it comes to sex, surely you're not going to stand there with a straight face and tell me that sex is a completely, utterly, absolute, selfless activity. Why, it's self-evident. It is so self-absorbed. It is so self oriented, self-focused. How in the world could you even conceive of the idea of sex and selflessness in the same sentence? And if, after all, you're right in saying that marriage becomes a kind of spiritual discipline to help train our character and make us strong spiritually, and you shouldn't have any expectations and ulterior motives for marriage and so on about what's in it for me, then surely the person we ought to marry is the most difficult, bitter, hateful, godless person we can find because that'll certainly guarantee I have no uh, hidden expectations. Uh, that'll make sure that I'm not in this for me, right? Well, let me clarify a few things that I would say in regard to these things. First of all, I'd be the first one to say this is difficult, but it doesn't change the demands of the gospel. I'll be honest with you, I find it difficult to do anything selflessly. Even the good that I do. C.S. Lewis warns us to be suspicious of what our real motivation is. I may very well find out on the day of judgment, all my church going, all my FC Bible teaching, all whatever good I think I've done for people was just self-absorption, self-service in a different guise. It is difficult, but that doesn't change the demand. There's one thing that can be pretty clear to us, and that is the message of the gospel can be boiled down to two words, a crucified Christ. And if we understand the call of the gospel is to deny self and take up our own cross and be crucified with Jesus and follow him, that's clearly the demand of the gospel. Now, how's that going to work? Well, secondly, I would say none of us have arrived at perfection. The important thing is we are growing in attempting to live up to the gospel. If I might paraphrase the words of that anguished father in Mark chapter 9 and verse 24, I believe, help my unbelief. I am unselfish, help my selfishness. And as Christians, we have committed ourselves to following this crucified Christ. We've committed ourselves to dying to self. And it is a process. It's going to take time. The process of spiritual reformation, of spiritual resurrection and renewal. We are walking in newness of life. Paul himself said in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, he had not yet attained to the resurrection from the dead. And I don't think he's talking about physical resurrection. That would be kind of a trivial point. I've not been physically resurrected, people, just so you know. Uh, but he had not attained to the fullness of spiritual resurrection. And he still pressed on to attain uh, that very thing. Thirdly, I would also say that unselfishness and personal benefit are not mutually exclusive. Because we derive a benefit from something doesn't mean we're being selfish. For example, we're supposed to glorify and praise God. We ought to derive some joy from that. But the joy is not the goal. The joy is not the end. Now, if it becomes an idol that displaces God, it, it is wrong. But as long as we keep the goal in the proper place and there is a benefit from it, well, that's God's plan and design. He does want us to delight in Him. He does want us to know the joy of relationship with Him and with other human beings. And so fourthly, I would say that's exactly the point. We have to keep our focus on the other you go back to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. Do nothing out of selfishness or empty conceit. Think of the other as more important than yourself. And then the light bulb goes on. And I think, this passage applies to my wife, Joy. And wouldn't it be great if I went home and said, Honey, don't you want to be the Christian woman God wants you to be? 
I have some advice for you. Turn to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3 and don't do anything out of selfishness and empty conceit and think of me as more important than you. Now, I've tried that. It doesn't work very well. So just as a practical matter, don't do that. Um, well, there's something self-defeating about that, isn't there? I, I suspect there might be some real godly, sincere Christian husband out there that could do that in all genuineness, trying to help his wife be a better Christian. I cannot. <laughs> and as Doy pointed out, my wife's obligation to submit to me, that's, that's between her and the Lord. Not for me to make her do that. And for her to think of me as more important than her, and she does an excellent job of that, I don't know how she does that, but that's between her and the Lord. And I need to worry about me thinking of her as more important than myself. And so we have to keep that focus where it belongs and not start thinking, well, what's in it for me? And then finally, as far as the selecting a maid and trying to find the worst possible person we can to really give us some spiritual challenges, what we're trying to do in our relationships is glorify God. And if you think about it, it's the same reason we want to select a good congregation of people to work with, to form a relationship with, and make a commitment to work together. You don't go find the worst possible congregation that has the most spiritual challenges because that will limit the scope of what you can do in serving the Lord. It may give you great challenges and help you grow in lots of ways, but it will limit your ability to do a lot of things for the Lord. But on the other hand, you don't go church shopping and show up and say, Hey folks, I'm here to be served. What are you going to do for me? And that's all the difference in attitude in selecting a mate. You know, if our attitude is, here I am, what are you going to do for me? What is marriage going to do for me? What is my wife going to do for me? That is so self-centered, contrary to the very demands of the gospel... On the other hand, what I'm wanting to do is glorify God, and here is an opportunity to participate in a relationship that if it is mutually reciprocated, it will blossom to its fullest potential, and that will glorify God. And that's what justifies those occasional references that Christians are to prefer one another. It's not because we love Christians more than we love people that are not Christians. But the fact of the matter is, no matter how much you love people that are in the world, people that are consumed by the philosophy of hatred of God, they will never reciprocate love. They will never reciprocate trust. They will never reciprocate the relationship. And so that stunts the possibilities that are available. But it, with people, you have confidence that the relationship can blossom and be reciprocated. God will be glorified. And so it is in our marriages. We want to find those people that we can blossom with, that together, forming one new entity, we can glorify God together. And so these are the parameters of the gospel, the demands of utter and absolute selflessness, the demand of utter otherness that we must be absolutely concerned about. And you think about the particular challenges this gives us in practical terms. Particularly for Christian men, you're to be the head of your home. And yet because of the culture in which we live, it's almost impossible for some Christian men to think of headship in any terms other than how power is understood to operate in the pagan world at large. It's about coercion. It's about force. It's about imposition of one's will on the unwilling. And if you talk to some brother who has that misguided notion, he, he almost shrugs and says, well, if that's not how it works, what else is there? What other way is there? I just don't even know any other possible way to be a head. Because they don't really know Christ. Because Christ did not come to be served, but to serve. He demonstrates that. But see the challenge. How easily headship is perverted and corrupted into some self-centered, self-serving thing and justified by Scripture because I'm the head of the house. And we have emphasized so much that the wives ought to submit to their husbands and men ought to be the heads of their house. But we need to equally emphasize, yes, you're to be the head of your house, but every decision you make, every action that you take, every word that you speak is to be done thinking your wife is more important than you and it is done for her best, her good, her good, 
and not your own. And even if it causes you harm, you sacrifice that for her. Now, how many godly Christian men do you think conceive of headship in their home quite in those terms? And that brings us back to the sex act. If headship can be so easily perverted into a self-serving, self-centered thing, how much more easily sex activity can be. When you think of the intensity of romantic desire and the pleasure of sex, how easily that can be perverted into just it's all about me and what I want and what I feel and what I deserve. And yet, nothing has changed in regard to the demands of the gospel. It's not as if the Bible says you need to deny self and you need to take up your cross daily and you need to follow Jesus, but that doesn't quite work in this area of life. Here, that just didn't really quite fit. You've got to try something else. There is no sex exemption that God has given for the demand of the gospel. And so let me ask you this. How many Christians do you believe have consistently and effectively used the sex act as a spiritual discipline to develop their character and draw closer to God? And perhaps even a more frightening question is, how many Christians do you think have ever even bothered to ask that question? To think those are the terms in which we ought to be speaking about sexuality. And yet it should be obvious to us as we consider books like the Song of Solomon or the affirmation in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, marriage is to be held honorable by all and the marriage bed undefiled, that marriage certainly has the potential of holiness and honor. And I say potential because it's not going to happen automatically. It doesn't happen by accident. It's only going to happen as the intentional exertion of our will to submit ourselves to God's will. And that means making sure that we avoid all of those things that sabotage relationship, bitterness and jealousy and resentment and unkindness and any manifestation of selfishness so that we are serving God according to the claims and the demands of the gospel in every way, including the sexual relationship. But that again is where people will say, well, no, that's just self-evident. That's not what sex is about. It is so self-centered. Well, let's consider two passages that relate to our topic. Two passages that I think either are overlooked or not quite understood very well. And the first of these is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, verses 3 through 8 in particular. And it's clear that this section forms a kind of, kind of unit together. The word holiness doesn't occur that often in the New Testament. And in these few verses, it occurs three times. And Paul begins by saying in verse 3, this is the will of God, your sanctification or your holiness. And it's clear he's not talking about this is the entirety of the holiness uh, God intends for us, but an aspect of it, and an aspect that in context appears to have to do with human sexuality. And so the first step in attaining to this holiness of God is you abstain from Sexual immorality, that's the umbrella instruction and application that's going to get us to this holiness. It is a sexual kind of holiness with which Paul is concerned. And then the second step in that process, he says in verse 4, that each one of you know how to acquire a vessel in holiness and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. And that's where we run into the difficulty. You say, what in the world does acquire your vessel mean? This is a difficult passage. I, I teach a course here about uh, doing biblical research and interpretation, and I normally give them this passage to research because, you know, they might take this view, they might take the other view, but they've got to document it and prove their case. I had a student actually submit a paper that he tried to defend the notion that to acquire a vessel meant to get a boat. So... A for effort, I guess. I don't know. Um, but basically, there are two views if we set aside the boat view for a moment. Um, and you'll notice this in a lot of translations. Uh, something to do with the body, taking the word vessel to refer to the human body, and saying something like possess your body or have control over your body. 
uh, a less common view in the translations, but much more common among commentators, is the idea that it has to do with getting married. And so the RSV uh, or the New American Bible say something like, get a wife. Well, whatever this passage means, there's one thing we could agree on, is that Paul could have expressed himself more clearly either way. If he meant have self-control over your body, he could have said that. If he meant get married, he could have said that. And so we have to deal with the fact the Holy Spirit decided to state the matter in a little more, uh, you know, ambiguous manner or a little bit round uh, about manner. And so we consider, first of all, this idea of the body. And those that would argue for that would say the Greek word skuos, that's translated vessel, is often used of the human body. And there's no doubt about that. There's plenty of evidence for that. Secondly, they would argue that an instruction about self-control would have application to all of the Christians at Thessalonica. You know, if it just said get married, well, that would really only apply, or get a wife, you know, that would only apply to the single men there, maybe, you know, two or three of them. Uh, but self-control, that applies to everybody, men, women, married, unmarried. Thirdly, and you could expect this, some would suggest that talking about the wife as a vessel, as a piece of property, is demeaning to women, and so that certainly can't be uh, the correct reading. And fourthly, some would suggest that the reason Paul says vessel instead of body is he's not really talking about the body as much as the sex organ, and so it becomes a kind of a euphemism, which might explain why Paul uh, used that uh, you know, less blunt term. Uh, I personally remain unconvinced by the uh, body argument. One reason is because when you look at how the word vessel is used of people, uh, it is always clear from the context what the person is a vessel of, like Paul being a vessel for the gospel, something like that. There are two exceptions to that I'm aware of in the New Testament. First Thessalonians 4.4, 4, you have no idea what this vessel is as a vessel of, a container of. And the other is 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, where, of course, Peter uses it of the wife. He talks about husbands honoring their wives as a weaker vessel. That might actually suggest the same kind of usage here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Secondly, I would point out that Paul does not say marriage is required. He doesn't say abstain from sexual immorality and acquire a vessel. He says know how to acquire a vessel. And so that instruction would equally apply to all the Christians, men and women, married and unmarried. Uh, even if you're already married, you need to know what's involved in that. What does godly marriage look like? How to teach others about that and so on. So the idea that the instruction will be restricted to just a handful of people I don't think applies at all. Thirdly, the accusation that calling the wife a vessel treats her like property really loses any kind of validity when you understand, yeah, the Bible does that, but it also treats men as property. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, calling the wife a weaker vessel implies he's some kind of vessel. And explicitly in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you have this mutual reciprocal analysis and even the use of a property imagery that the husband does not have authority over his body but the wife, and the wife does not have authority over her body but the husband. And as we're on this property imagery, uh, it also ties in with verse 6. Of First Thessalonians chapter 4. The, the third step in this process is that you're not to uh, transgress and defraud your brother in this matter. And all three of those words, transgress, defraud, matter, are business terms that tie in with the property imagery uh, in verse 4. And it seems to me it makes for a logical kind of sequence. I, God wants you to be holy in regard to sexuality, so stay away from sexual immorality. And one subcategory of that knowledge of how to stay away from sexual immorality is, well, know how to acquire a sexual partner in holiness and honor. But you don't do it in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. That also suggests that whatever this acquiring of a vessel is, it's something that can be done poorly. It's something that can be done in passion of lust. And so if you say it's self-control of the body, well, I don't know, you know, self-control itself suggests control, not being out of control. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in self-control in my passion of lust, no. And so it suggests more so the idea of acquiring something else. And furthermore, that's really what this verb means, to acquire. 
Now what happens is a lot of people make up their mind what skuos means, that's the body. And now we take the verb and we kind of massage it around and say, well, possess or control or something like that. But the fact of the matter is, of these two words, vessel and acquire, acquire is much more certain as to what its meaning is. It's, it's pretty relatively fixed. Every usage you can find in the New Testament is talking about acquisition. And the word vessel really is pretty close to the English word stuff. I mean, it can be used of almost anything. So if, if you're going to work any word around the other, stick with the one you know. We're acquiring something. Now, what is the vessel we're acquiring? And the fact that it says his own vessel, that, again, doesn't make a lot of sense if you're talking about his own, but, well, who else's body is he going to be uh, exerting self-control over that kind of thing? But if it is talking about acquiring a partner in the sexual relationship, that would make sense. Get your own. And in doing so, don't defraud your brother in taking what's his. It makes perfect sense. And it may also explain why Paul doesn't say get a wife. First of all, he may not be wanting to make it gender specific that a woman can acquire a vessel, a sexual partner, just as much as a man can. Or it may be that he wants to keep it open to the idiom of what the Gentiles are doing. They're certainly not interested in marriage like the Christians are, but they are acquiring their vessels and they're doing so in passion of lust. And Paul said, don't do that. But there is a way you can acquire a sexual partner. And for the Christian, that does mean marriage, but it is to be done in holiness and in honor. Well, if that is the correct way of reading this verse, it does a couple of things for us. First of all, it explicitly forbids us to engage in a sexual relationship out of selfish lust. That has no place. It is a reminder that the call of the gospel encompasses every aspect of life. No exception for the sexual relationship. There too, we deny self. We take up the cross and we follow Jesus. And secondly, we need to maintain holiness and honor in our relationship. And that's not just in the sex act, but in all aspects of marriage. And you think about the coupling together of those two words, holiness or purity. What that is suggesting is it's uncontaminated by any aspect of self. And so zero part of Tom in this thing. And then honor is wholly about the other. 100% of the other. And so the coupling of those two together, nothing for me, the entirety of it for the other, is as God has designed it to be. Now if it turns out that the body view or some kind of self-control is what Paul's talking about, the teaching remains the same. It's just not as explicit. Now the second passage we could look at briefly is 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and Mark uh, referred to this a little bit and I will deal with it in some more detail. But the thing we have to acknowledge up front with 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is this is an aberration. This is an anomaly. You look at scripture and the entirety of scripture from Genesis through Revelation is that marriage is not just good, it is declared by God as part of the creation as very good. And so to tie in with Mark's lesson, if you have a different estimation of marriage, you need to change your estimation. You need to bring your thinking in line with God's thinking. He said it is very good. Marriage is very good. Sexuality within marriage, very good. The Song of Solomon makes it clear to us that it's something to be celebrated. Paul, not once but twice, emphasizes that those spiritual individuals that will serve as overseers in local congregations must have been married. You know, if, if we're talking about these are second-rate people of a lesser caliber of spirituality, that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But that's what he demands. And the analogy of Christ and the church, of marriage, emphasizes the nature, the holy and honorable nature of that relationship. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, as we've already mentioned, explicitly talk about marriage as that which is honorable and holy. And on top of all of that, if you forbid marriage, you're teaching the doctrine of demons according to Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. So that's the picture of the entirety of the Bible. And there's one section that would give people some kind of pause to think, oh, there's something questionable or suspicious about marriage. And so you start looking at chapter 7. You say, well, first of all, I'm going to be careful not to build some elaborate 
you know, doctrine on this one aberration of a chapter that makes me wind up denying everything else the Bible says about marriage. Not going to do that. And so we start looking at chapter 7 carefully and we realize it's chock full of advice that Paul gives to the Corinthians rather than apostolic instructions saying, well, you got to do this and you got to do that. And so when it comes to marriage, you want to get married? Fine. You don't want to get married? Fine. You don't sin if you do. You don't sin if you don't. And in fact, his advice he gives contradicts his advice he gives in other places. Like in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14, he wants the younger widows to get remarried. Here he says, no, don't get remarried. Don't get married at all. And why is that? Well, he says in verse 26, because of the present distress. He wants them to avoid affliction uh, in verse 28. Now, we don't need to settle what all of that is. At least we can conclude at this time and place... That was Paul's practical advice. But even then, it's not a command. It's not an expectation he has of them. And yet, how the chapter begins is kind of interesting because this is where he does issue his apostolic instructions. He gives a series of imperatives and says, this is what you've got to do, right? And so because of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it's kind of peculiar setting, there are two ideas about marriage and sexuality that have been contrived from this passage that I think are misplaced. One, as Mark mentioned, is that marriage is a morally and spiritually inferior state compared to celibacy. And secondly, that marriage by that peculiar spiritual alchemy is able to transform lust from virtue or from vice into virtue. And it really has a lot to do with how you read the first seven verses. And so those that want to exalt celibacy, look at verse 1. Good for a man not to touch a woman, which is clearly a euphemism for sexual relation. And verse 7, I want everybody to be like me. And then verses 2 through 6 become an aside. That's, well, you know, if you're too weak, you can't do this. Well, then get married. You know, God's created that kind of concession for you and your weakness. But I think it's just the opposite. Verses 2 through 6 are the substance of his instruction. And verse 1 is probably a slogan from the Corinthians. It was their idea. Oh, it's good not to have sexual relations with a woman. Now, like all the other Corinthian slogans, it's something Paul would agree with in a sense, but he so qualifies it by the time he gets done. It's like, not what you people mean by it. <laughs> no. And it seems they had developed this notion that you should not get married. And that's why Paul addresses that in the latter part of the chapter and saying, you don't sin if you do or if you don't. And they develop these mistaken notions about the body and sexuality. So they say, don't get married. But if you've already made the mistake of getting married, quit having sexual relations with your spouse. And if you find that too difficult, get a divorce. And certainly if you're married to a non-Christian. And Paul addresses all of those things. And it's all rooted in a very basic misunderstanding the Corinthians have. And so what does Paul say about it? He says, stop depriving one another. He says, you've got to pay what you, you owe, what is due to each other. You don't have authority over your own body, but your spouse does. And everybody understands all three of those verses are referring to sexuality. Well, verse 2 is as well. And it's complicated a little bit by how some translations handle this because they'll say, well, each man ought to have his own wife. And so it's an instruction to get married, and it ought to be a monogamous marriage between a man and a woman. That is not what Paul's saying. The word have is another euphemism for sex. Remember chapter 5, the guy who had his father's wife? Didn't mean he had her locked up in a closet somewhere. Uh, and, and you know, of course the word have as many normal usages throughout the Bible. It has the sexual use as well. What Paul is saying is every husband must have sexual relations with his wife. And the wife must have sexual relations with her husband. And he repeats that three times. And then concludes, stop depriving one another. And so that's his instruction not a command to marry because after all in verse 2 if he says yeah every man's got to get married it's an imperative then he's directly contradicting what he says later in the chapter where he says hey you don't have to get married and he's actually advising them not to get married and so what happens in this chapter is people look at uh, the beginning of verse 2 because of fornication it's actually in the plural because acts of fornication were already happening and in verse 9 in talking to those that have been widowed, he says, if they do not have self-control or if they can't control themselves, you know, different translations will render that. And that leaves the wrong impression. First of all, it's a first-class condition, which in Greek means it assumes that it's true for sake of argument. 
since this is happening. And it isn't that they don't have self-control or can't have self-control. It's they're not exercising self-control. And since they're not, what do they need to do? Well, if you want to have a sexual relationship, there's only one way to do that and be right with God, and that's within the confines of a committed marriage relationship. And it's not the marriage relationship itself, per se, that's the solution, but rather the intense commitment to this relationship of utter absolute selflessness and utter otherness. And so you think about it, the real temptation in marriage is to have the pleasure without the pain, to have all of the benefit without any of the hard work, and to substitute a superficial, perverted, counterfeit connection with somebody and reject a genuine human personal relationship that is hard work, requires real effort. And the problem is most of our relationships, you go to work, you punch the clock, you come home, that's the nature of that relationship. Even your kids, they grow up and leave home. There is one person that you have a constant commitment to 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no vacation. It is an unrelenting demand of utter and absolute selflessness. And the temptation is, surely there's got to be something in it for me. You know, the allure of pornography, to have the sexual pleasure without any obligation. And so that just for today, just for an hour, just for five minutes, can't I just do this for me? And it's a repudiation of the very gospel. And so the solution is to bring our sexual desires, as all others, into submission to the will of God, denying self to serve the other, and that is our spouse and to be utter, utter and absolute selfless in all that we do. Will we fail? Yes. I am dismayed at just how much I do fail. I'm dismayed at, even after all these years, the powerful effect that a picture of a half-naked woman on a billboard can have on me. And I have a choice just to throw up my hands in despair and wallow in self-pity and, well, I'm just doomed, or I can repent. And I can try to find satisfaction in the only thing in this world that can truly satisfy. And that's not my wife. It's not the brethren. It's not the college. It's not anything but God. And that's where we must seek our satisfaction. And I hope John will have some things to say along that line in his lecture. Uh, thank you for your attention this morning.